So it's five o'clock. I'm looking at that participants list and I see you've still got some folks joining. So we'll give it another uh, minute or two before we get started. All right, folks are still trickling in, but in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get started. So thanks, thanks everybody for uh, taking the time to be with us tonight. I'm looking and we, we already have about 160 folks, which doesn't surprise me. I think we've, we've averaged uh, over the course of these, these uh, series of town hall meetings about 170 people uh, and, and gotten up to a couple hundred a, a couple times. So really appreciate the participation and uh, um, we've got a really brief presentation for you tonight. Uh, we want to carve out the majority of our time to, to hear from you all. But before we get started, I, 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 I just really want to offer a special thanks to those of you who have been engaged and tuned in during this in, entire process. It's, it's been a long haul, um, but I'm grateful for all of your questions, all of your comments, and, and the proposals we've received. So on behalf of the department and the FISH program, I want to thank you all for, for your engagement. I also want to acknowledge and thank our tribal co-managers. We, we committed to a, I'll call it a new process. It's really not a new process. It's a, it's a, it's a condensed process. And without the, the commitment of the, of, a, of the tribal co-managers, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be where we are today. So much, much appreciation and respect for our tribal co-managers for, for their engagement. Uh, next slide, please, Jane. So we've got this obligatory Zoom etiquette slide that we like to share with folks. And I find it helpful. Uh, a lot of times people forget how to, how to engage. We wanna make sure folks have the opportunity to, to engage uh, with us. Um, so if you've, if you've uh, got a question, you can either type that into the Q&A function or you can raise your hand. If you're on your phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine. If you're on your computer, you can simply click the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen. And when called upon, you'll need to unmute yourself. And you can, you can do that by dialing uh, star six if you're on the phone or click the microphone icon on your computer. And like the last meeting, we wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So we, we're asking you to limit your question or comment to one at a time. 
at which point you can re-raise your hand and, and you'll go back in the queue. But we want to we want to give folks uh, an opportunity. You know, we want to hear from as many people as possible. And then lastly, uh, I, I don't. We haven't had any issues with this in the previous three meetings. I don't anticipate any tonight. But please, let's let's be professional. No cursing. Let's be respectful. Um, and let's assume good intentions from from all all the speakers and, and people who are asking questions. Next slide, James. Maybe just take a, a, a minute to, to go over where we've been and, and where we are. You can see we're at the kind of the 11th hour here with our uh, final town hall, town hall number four. I need to let you know that the, the, the town hall number four as advertised said that we would communicate the director's decision on agreed to fishing plans. I need to provide a little bit of a, of, of a caveat here. Um, what we will be presenting tonight are the recommendations for the director's decision. And it's really a, it's a technicality with everything going on. We haven't had adequate time to fully brief the director. He's aware of what we're presenting tonight. And I have no reason to believe that um, anything will change. And you all can expect to see a news release come out tomorrow that announces the rules uh, as they are presented tonight. And then on December 1, which is Wednesday, um, the, the rules will be officially announced. Um, that'll likely happen tomorrow, um, but it's a pretty significant rule package and the rules themselves uh, might not go out until, or might not be published in, until, until Wednesday, but we're hoping to get it all done tomorrow. Next slide, James. So in terms of our agenda, it's a pretty slim agenda. We'll be going over, our, as I mentioned, our recommended regulations for the upcoming seasons. And again, these, these recommendations will, will go to the director tomorrow for his consideration. Um, I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. The, the, what you will hear tonight will represent, will likely uh, represent what uh, you read tomorrow in a news release. I have no reason to believe that anything will be different. Um, once we've uh, talked about these, these recommendations, we're gonna turn it over to you and have the conversation uh, like we have in the past. So again, we're, we're gonna be pretty quick and, and uh, save a bunch of time for, for that conversation. Next slide, Jane. So for those of you who attended the last town hall meeting, this, this table will be familiar. It shows an analysis of ideas that we heard from you in terms of proposals and based on our impact limit shows where we are able to provide a fishery, which is indicated in the green boxes and where we are, we are not, which is indicated in the red boxes. And on the very next slide, you will see the very same table. Uh, the difference will be you will see bold boxes around the river specific regulations. And these bold boxes will represent the rules for the upcoming season. Next slide, James. So again, drawing your attention to the bolded boxes, we will be closed in the Chehalis, Pump Tulip, Upper Quinault, and in the Queets Clearwater. In the Willapa and in the Ho, we will be under last year's regulations. And in the Quilute, we will be fishing from a floating device in select waters. So to, to provide a little more detail, let's go to the next slide, James. So here's the detail. So Chehalis River, uh, the sport fishery will be closed, as will the treaty fishery. In the Hump Tulips, same deal. In the Quinault, the sport fishery will be closed. And we're waiting on the final package from the tribe. We expect to hear from them tomorrow and be able to hopefully finalize that, that management plan. And we've got the same situation in the, in the Quinault, where the sport fishery is closed and we're waiting the final package from the tribe. Queets Clearwater is the same as the Quinault. And in the Quilute system, will be open December 1st through March 31st. Selective gear, gear rules, single point barbless hook, no fishing from a floating device except main stem quilute and below the 101 bridges on the Bogashiel and Kalawa rivers. We will release all rainbow trout. There'll be a two hatchery steelhead bag limit. With respect to the treaty fishery, 
It's modeled at 48.7 days, so 40, about 48 days and expected to catch 6% below their allocation. On the Ho River will be open December 1 through March 31st. Selective gear rules, no fishing from a floating device. Release all wild rainbow trout, two hatchery steelhead bag limit. The treaty fishery is 18 days and expected to catch 13% below their allocation. Next slide, Jane. So again, the Zoom reminders, star nine on your phone, icon if you're on your computer, to unmute on your phone, star six, if you're calling from a landline. If you have a technical issue during the webinar, please drop us a note in the Q&A and we'll try to help you through it. And then you can continue to leave your questions and comments in written format on our online portal. And with that, uh, we'll pump the brakes and uh, go to your questions and comments. And Liam, asking you to help us navigate that, please. Okay, and it looks like our first question is from David. David, I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, this is David Moskowitz with the Conservation Angler. And um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to these. It's a little difficult uh, to uh, have, a, I think, a complete review of these particular rules, but there's a few things that jump right out at us. Um, given the number, the low numbers of wild fish, um, having a two hatchery fish bag limit per angler for the open times and waters is, uh, is gonna increase um, lethal encounters with wild fish. You can be fishing for hatchery fish, but you can't control which fish is taking the gear. Um, it should be one and done. Wherever this two, two hatchery steelhead bag limit is, it's, it's excessive and it's gonna to lead to too many wild, lethal wild encounters. Having the boat fishery on just those waters on the Quileute system is gonna to lead to an effort shift that is also gonna increase lethal wild encounters on steelhead. <clears throat> and we don't believe that the department has the means to really monitor that effectively. Um, and that worries us a great deal. And finally, in terms of the focus on the bogus shield in particular, a little bit on the Kalawa, the fact that that fishery would go from the 101 bridge uh, during that entire season to focus on hatchery fish it is exactly the past practice that Washington has used for far, far, far too long. The early winter run, wild winter run fish are the most vulnerable. They're probably the most important part of the run. They're the ones who are gonna be able to, when they do spawn, to be able to, if they do, to, their, their offspring are gonna do better with the climate change that has very warm water in the spring. Th this is a continuation of a failed management regime that is that we've seen throughout Puget Sound and now we're, we've been seeing it out here on the peninsula. Um, it's just, it's, it's not appropriate given the emergency room state of these fish. So we're, it's not that we're excited about the closed fisheries, but these fisheries that are planned are gonna encounter more fish than we have the impact rates for. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you tonight. I know that uh, you and your staff um, James Losey's staff in Region 6 have been working hard on this. 
but we're disappointed. Thank Thanks. you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Appreciate your comments, David. Hey, Kelly, um, I may just speak briefly to the bag limit reduction because I think that question is going to come up for others. Uh, David, I respect your other comments as well. Um, I know you thought hard about these. For the bag limit reduction, it's important for folks, for folks to know uh, we've explored the team here, the uh, risk associated with hatchery fish on the spawning grounds, the genetic risk, um, and also the risk uh, with uh, encounters on wild fish with people uh, having directed fisheries toward hatchery fish. So we're kind of balancing that. So it's important to note that uh, a reduction in bag limit from two fish to one hatchery fish um, is affecting primarily those people that catch two hatchery fish. And that's very few. So when you look at catch record card data, about 25% of people or less achieve their full bag limit. So by reducing bag limit to one fish, uh, the savings aren't exactly 50%. And uh, they may uh, be not significant, but if someone does catch a hatchery fish, this fishery that we have in place, we think really supports the removal of those fish from the spawning grounds. So thanks again, David, for your comments. James, can I make one more con one one response to that? And I appreciate how it's not a, a, a direct relationship. So I, I, I'll, I'll look into that and I do appreciate that part that the, the um, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, the, the, there is one, there's something it doesn't, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I talked myself right out of my point. Thanks a lot, James. And next is Zachary. Zachary, I've allowed you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. So first of all, I want to say that I, I support the uh, recommendations and the features you guys have done with the Sort of exception of I hope that we can sort of sort out the whole Queets escapement disagreement but I also really want to say that I appreciate the willingness on the co-managers parts to share their fisheries I know there's a lot of it's easy to sort of get caught up in that now I know a lot of people tend to blame the tribes um, and so I like any sort of transparency is great and I really appreciate that but with all that said what sort of concrete steps are being done by the department to make sure that our coastal seal runs return to stable levels so there can both healthy populations and healthy fisheries. Um, I know there's some efforts on the Wainuchi and Sats up to improve the habitat, but that seems kind of small in the face of the massive declines. Is there anything major being done or is it basically just a hope and pray for colder oceans? Yeah, I think uh, maybe I'll take a, an initial stab, James. So one of the challenges we have out on the coast is a lack, and, and folks who've been engaged uh, in this, um, <laughs> I, I probably sound like a broken record, but we have a lot of uncertainty with these populations out on the coast, just based on the lack of m and &E resources that we have out there. So we've got a pretty significant supplemental budget package for freshwater monitoring that we're gonna dedicate to this effort to try to um, decrease the uncertainty around things like abundance and, and you know, other, other, other issues. Um, in, in many cases, we've got good habitat in terms of of um, you know ocean conditions, that's a factor that uh, has has got has has our has our attention and our concern. Um, but I do think that that we've got some systems that are on the precipice of, of turning around. And I'll, I'll maybe before I get too far out over my skis, I'll, I'll I'll let James talk more about that. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, uh, while hoping and praying may be one of the tools in the sort of broader fishing communities toolkit, that's not the main one for us. Um, so Kelly talked about some of this good habitat. Meeting the current management objectives is something we've failed to do over the past few years. And that's the best way uh, to buffer those effects of poor ocean conditions. So what we're trying to do right now is put these tools in place that when ocean conditions and freshwater productivity um, turn the corner, um, we've sort of set the table for fish to bounce back. So longer term plans for sure, but these discussions at the town hall are really short term decisions we can make to, to maximize our effort to allow steelhead to recover. So good question, thanks Zach. And our next question is from Paul. Paul, I have allowed you to unmute. Good evening, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope you all had a great holiday.
my question was I wanted to make sure I heard that correctly about the whole river that that's going to be December 1st to March and it's closed for all flotation devices. And is that the whole whole river closed for flotation devices? Yes, that's that's correct, Paul. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Next we have Brian. Brian, I've allowed you to unmute. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Hey, again, thank you guys for holding this uh, series of uh, public uh, forums. I really appreciate it. I have a quick comment and then a, and then a question. Um, going back to the chart where you had the red and green boxes and of the analysis of impacts, you've got pretty much green across the board, except for the Chehalis um, for last year's regulations with reduced days, including for the Quinault and the Queets Clearwater. And I think some people are going to be asking you questions about, well, if you could have had, if you had a green box there, why couldn't we have had some type of a season there? Now, you know, I've submitted uh, pretty lengthy comments to you suggesting that I don't think a season would have been consistent with your uh, statewide steelhead management policy guidance. And so I understand why it will be closed, but you might want to explain that a little bit to folks, because I think there'll be some questions about that. And then my, my question to you is this, on the Ho River, um, in the numbers that you sent to me, James, it looked like we used about 50% of the non-treaty uh, sport fish impacts for last year. And that if we, it looks like we have the same rules as we had last year. And I'm just wondering, have you run a model on that with the, with the rules that, that you're gonna be putting in place this year to, uh, to come up with, you know, our projected sport catch and then the impact level and what percent of our impact allocation we would be using. Yeah, I'll, I think I can get at both of those pretty quick. So the last one you said, the short answer there, Brian, is yes. The caveat with any estimates of sport impacts uh, in coastal rivers is that we're li really limited by sport fish monitoring. So uh, different than the treaty fisheries, there's a lot of error around any estimate that we, sort of predictions we have for sport impact and sport catch. Um, so that's important. And then uh, for the Chehalis, Hump Tulips, Upper Quinault and Queets, there's a lot of red in there. Um, we've highlighted three green boxes for the Hump Tulips, Upper Quinault, Queets Clearwater. Um, those uh, three green boxes, of course, like all the green boxes, there's risk associated with those rules. When we move forward into co-manager discussions, um, we discuss that risk and uh, what, what level of risk we're comfortable with. So specifically in the Hump Tulips, we had full support from the Quinault tribe for the most conservative uh, management regulations we could apply for both the state and the treaty fisheries. And so that provides the greatest certainty that we'll meet our management objectives. While there's another one green box there that provides um, some certainty that we would, our tribal co-managers um, agreed with us and specifically on the hump tulips that a full closure was necessary for that. So. That's how we got there. I think the shorter way to say it is previously when we shared this table, we had an asterisk at the bottom that described the importance of these co-manager agreements. Um, so those really reflected themselves in the Chehalis, Hump Tulips, Upper Quinault, and Queets. Thank you, Brian. Next we have Rich. Rich, I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, James. Hi, Kelly. Hope you guys can hear me. Loud and clear. Yeah, this is Rich Sims. Hey, um, I'd just like to get a little bit better understanding of what the regulation is regarding the salt duck. I wasn't really quite clear on that. If you could kind of explain that to me a little bit. I saw what you had for the Kalawa and the bogey. Yeah, the sole duck will be uh, no fishing from a floating device. So fishing from a floating device will be allowed from the mouth of the soil duck downstream. So it's really the main stem quill you, um, and then from the 101 bridges below the bogus shell and the Kalawa. Okay, so that leads me to my second question. Thank you for clarifying that. 
that leads me to my second question regarding the bogus shield and the Klawa. We're allowing fishing from a boat below the one-on-one -on -one bridge. Um, I'm confused with that just because, you know, those two systems seem to be more the underperforming systems. And, you know, with a regulation like that, it seems like we're gonna be beating up on those two systems the whole season. Um, I guess I could see it or understand it a little bit better if it was a targeted hatchery fishery for like, you know, the early part of the season, but I, I just don't get the logic with that. Yeah, thanks. So we've heard here a couple of questions about uh, the risk associated with impact to the early uh, portion of the run risk associated with allowing hatchery fish to escape to the spawning ground. So again, those are things we're trying to balance. Uh, Rich, in the past town halls, I think you've highlighted the need to protect bogus shield and Kalawa steelhead specifically, um, but also those on the Solduck, right, that are important. So in the place that's least likely to hold hatchery origin steelhead, the Solduck, we've got the most conservative regulation there. In the Bogusheel River, we're interested in providing as much opportunity as we can toward those hatchery fish. So the lower section of the Bogusheel, so that's the lower portion right below the 101, uh, provides that opportunity to target hatchery origin steelhead. But it also doesn't create a fishery that has disproportionate impact on the early end of the run through the use of boats and the late end of the run. So I hope that sort of clarifies some of that, but um, I think there's more discussion there to be had. So thanks. And next we have Mark. Mark, I've allowed you to unmute. Thank you. This is Mark LaRosier, and I have a question, and then depending on the answer of that, I want to follow up with a comment. So the closure for the Chehalis River, does that mean all the river systems in the Chehalis River basin are closed, including the Wainuchi River? It does. Okay, so then... Up at the Wainuchi Dam fish trap last winter, as a result of no fishing from floating devices, there was a very strong return, uh, somewhere over 500. I don't remember the exact number. It might have been quite a bit more than that. Um, a, a large portion of those fish were hatchery origin. There were some taken for broodstock for the hatchery system, but uh, a number were also taken upstream and released above Wainuchi Dam. What is the plan this year, James, for the disposition of hatchery fish at the Wainuchi Trap that are surplus to broodstock needs? Yeah, you're highlighting, Mark, a really important challenge here. When we uh, implement regulations that reduce the impact on wild steelhead, they also reduce the impact on hatchery steelhead, right? So fewer hatchery fish caught. And as you noted, uh, additional fish escaping to the hatchery rack. So this is a challenge we're gonna face in future years as we uh, recover these coastal steelhead populations. We don't have a, a lot of tools at our disposal with those, those surplus hatchery fish. One of them that we do, we do have, this is a longer discussion, but we can move those hatchery fish into lakes that are closed systems. Um, there's a couple other creative opportunities um, we've talked about. We ran a study last year to understand what happens when you live spawn a hatchery steelhead and return it back to the river. So a couple of these sort of recycling programs, moving fish to lakes are things we're discussing, but the priority to recover or protect wild steelhead, um, one byproduct of that will be more hatchery fish escaping to the hatchery rack. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate. I appreciate that. Um, I, I would urge the department, though, to consider in some cases uh, literally giving away hatchery origin steelhead, making them available for people to pick up. Idaho Department of Fish and Game has done this regularly, and um, I think that it can be done in, in a manner in certain locations that uh, is reasonable. And rather than for those fish to just be um, sold or whatever put in the lakes. I don't think the whole lake fishery for adult steelhead is terribly successful 
Uh, anyway, that's my final comment is just uh, like the department to consider actually giving those fish away, making them available to the public. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And next we have Kyle. Kyle, I have allowed you to unmute. Kyle. Okay, I'm going to lower your hand. And next we have Neil. Neil, I have requested you to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh yeah, just a recreational fisherman. Um, I had a couple quick questions. Uh, first off, we appreciate the, the fact that there was a little bit more transparency leading up to the season. So it's not just me, but I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. Um, and then just two quick questions. Uh, one, how is a total closure on certain systems gonna result in uh, a different outcome than certain other systems like maybe throughout Puget Sound that have long been shut down but haven't yet led to significant population recoveries. And then also, uh, I guess kind of a to leapfrog off that, what steps is the department taking to ensure that there's a not a similar outcome to those where the populations haven't recovered? Yeah, so I can get the first one um, pretty easy here. So in populations like the Chehalis, where we have the potential of still escaping over 5,000 steelhead, that full closure by the state and the tribes provides that greatest likelihood sort of maximum chance to maximize diversity and productivity and abundance. So mm -hmm. in places like the Chehalis, confidence is high that this is one step toward that recovery, meeting our management objectives. But I would highlight that places like the Quinault River, where we're seeing, we're forecasting the lowest steelhead run size ever. So it's about 1,700 wild steelhead in a river that could likely support, um, you know, historically, uh, you know, 10,000 wild steelhead or more. These are ones we're going to watch really closely. Um, and so these sort of longer term plans that you're talking about are, are going to be important across the board. But in places like the Quinault, um, we're, we're extremely focused on uh, you know, things beyond just a full closure. So thanks for highlighting that. The second question I think was about those long-term sort of recovery plans. And um, I think Kelly highlighted it before, but these non-ESA listed populations are really hard to generate focus and funding toward um, because we've got you know, this long priority list of, of federally listed species that we're focused on. So to try to drive some of that money or new money, um, you know, on these coastal populations and this this work before we're in these recovery phases is uh, is going to be really important beyond just regulation changes. Thank you, and we're going to try Kyle again. He said he was having a hard time unmuting, oh, and he's disappeared. So. I take that back. We are going to go to Bob. Bob, I have requested you to unmute. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Hope you guys had a good holiday. Um, so uh, I guess the question first is on the Shahela system, you say the treaty fisheries closed. Is that the minute you guys put out the regulation change? Is the treaty fishery closed for their cohos that they officially typically fish in December? Yeah, the scheduled closure date for um, both the Quinault tribe, the Chehalis tribe, and the state is December 1. So assuming um, the director moves forward with these regulations, we'd have a close closure to all fishing December 1 through the end of April. Okay. And then in regards to the the I guess I'm a little confused with the Kuliut system. Seems like the Solduck has the highest population of fish. The majority of the run comes from there, um, but we're not gonna allow a boat fishery there when almost every town hall meeting we've had, James and particularly you, have expressed your grave concern over the and it's less than stellar performance the last couple of years. So by having a boat fishery on that, and the fact that the fact that the that the sole duck is so hard to wade, it's going to put 
increased pressure on there by boats. And we already saw an increase in pressure to the hoe last year. And that was nothing more than a closure of the Southwest stream. So we had additional guides come up that would normally not fish the hoe. So those people are gonna be there again. And then the other thing with the hoe is the only reason the pressure was there was because it's the easily wadeable river. Most of us went there because that's where our clients could wade reasonably. So I don't see that the, the quilute's gonna, or the solduck itself is gonna see considerably less pressure just like it has. But then we're gonna shove more pressure onto the Bogusheel and the Kalawa, which are two significantly smaller streams. I, I would, am I to speculate, am I, am I, maybe I'm speculating, but my guess is that we're gonna have a hatchery fishery. And I know it's predicted to be open through the end of March to fish from our boats. But my guess is that by some by, by the end of January, we're probably going to pull the plug on that and make it a bank, a bank only or close it would be my guess because we're going to see increased pressure. Is that a possibility and something you guys are going to be watching for? Yeah, so there was a lot to unpack there, Bob. I appreciate it. there's a lot of comments that we should talk about to, uh, you know, after this town hall, if we can't get to them all here. But the assumption that there's um, some other sort of backup rule that we haven't placed in front of you in these town halls is, is uh, totally false. And I know you're not like accusing, but it's fair for you to ask that question. Uh, no, there is no kind of hidden agenda that if things look bad, we'll focus our fishery, you know, boat fishery in the, in the bogus shield will somehow pull that. So that said, there could be emergency rules in season, but there's no plan, uh, you know, late season closure that we're talking about. The sold deck is one that people have been really focused on as one of these places that's lofted the total escapement of quillute fish um, up. But what I would also um, maybe suggest that we look closer at, and we have in previous town halls, is these river specific escapement goals. When we go to the sold deck and the bogus shield and the Klawa, um, our, uh, our supporting uh, you know, our, we've met our escapement in the Soldak, but I don't think we describe that as a huge success in the sense that we've exceeded the escapement by a lot of fish. This is still a sensitive area like the rest of the Kuliu system. But one thing I've noted here, and I've heard now a couple of times, is that maybe the fishery on the Bogusheel was a little bit too liberal. So we felt like that lower end of the, of the Bogusheel allows access to those hatchery fish. Um, doesn't disproportionately affect the early end of the run, um, but also protects the majority of the bogus shield. Uh, so that, but what I'm hearing is maybe that was a little too liberal. The other last note that you said, Bob, that I think is really important is this shift in angler effort to the hoe that was observed last year by a lot of anglers. And we heard that from many people that spent a lot of time on the water and factored that in. So I appreciate all the folks that brought that to our attention because some of that, our creel work wasn't sensitive enough to detect that it looks like. So what I would ask the angling community this year and all of our creel work this year is to try to understand if some of that shifting effort is relieved by allowing a boat fishery in the Quileute. And so this is something maybe Bobby can't answer right here and maybe we don't have time for, but that is something I wonder if folks think that a lot of those uh, increased wading anglers on the Ho River will be moving back to their boats in the Quileute. So that's a question um, we're interested in asking. We think that there is space from both the tribal fishery and the state fishery uh, to provide some comfort or buffer uh, around this shifting effort. So we'll have to see how that plays out. So thanks for all the comments, Bob. And next we have Brad. Brad, I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, are, hi, are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, thank you all for the commentary so far. Um, I guess I'm quite curious, you know, this is a pretty bleak looking report and it's not the first year in a row. Are your managers looking at success elsewhere in pretty similar areas where you know, logging has affected habitat among millions of other things. And, you know, they, they migrated out into the same ocean on Oregon's North Coast. They have been doing wild brood stock since sometime in the early 2000s or late 90s. Um, some of the more experienced people on this probably could correct me on that. But 
that program has pretty clearly strengthened both wild and hatchery fish. Last season, we had a brutal year on the Oregon North Coast fishing there, like Washington did. You know, I reduced my effort in Washington because of the low numbers, but we saw very strong wild fish, even though there weren't that many hatchery fish. So I hear a lot of anti-hatchery sentiment on this call, and I know that segregated stocks can damage the genetic quality of the runs returning these special rivers, but has it been considered that wild brood stock, um, as escapement permits, can bolster both the wild and um, harvestable portions of this run? Yeah, Brad, I, I appreciate that comment. And I think one of the things that we regroup after this process and, and you know, those to come in the years is we really sit down and think hard about, you know, these really smart hatchery programs that fit the needs of our anglers, you know, produces fish that enter the creel and enter tribal net fisheries. Um, so this is, this would be the long-term goal is these really smart hatchery programs. We have been uh, in communication with Oregon because, um, you know, there's been a lot of these popularized integrated programs there, but I do think that there needs to be a strategic sort of focused analysis of whether Oregon is getting the things they want out of this. I'm not the person to do that, but there's been some skepticism whether the way these programs have been described, um, you know, is, is really the best fit for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and maybe it is. The other thing I want to highlight on that that I think I'm really glad you brought this up is it's important for folks to recognize in the Chehalis, we rely heavily on integrated programs. And there's not a lot of people that are arguing those are extremely successful for either wild or hatchery steelhead. So um, if those integrated programs aren't the ones that we want and we want to look at other integrated programs, we probably want to look at ones that were different than ours. So kind of a longer discussion there, but it is something we're thinking hard about, but we're not, um, we're not sure, you know, the perfect program is something that um, we've seen yet, but we want to get there. So thanks. Okay. And next we have Kyle. Kyle, let's see if we can get it to go this time. Yeah. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, we can hear you. Cool. Well, thanks for letting me speak. I've enjoyed um, following along here today. Um, First of all, just wanted to say that I'm an angler, um, a passionate angler, <clears throat> both fly fisherman and gear angler since I was a young boy. Um, and I wanna, um, wanna emphasize to WDFW to really put the thoughts of the anglers um, because through my experience, the anglers are the biggest proponents of the fish. You know, there's no ulterior motives behind what the anglers want. Um, and so I guess the I just wanted to get that comment through. And then the question that I have is, you know, I've heard people today talk about, you know, hopefully ocean conditions will improve. Hopefully this will improve. Hopefully that will improve. I think we can all agree that um, the state of the environment um, is probably not going to improve anytime soon. And even so, that's completely out of our hands. You know, that's a worldwide global scale. So I guess apart from just curbing people being in boats and certain fishing opportunities, um, which I think a lot of us would agree, there's a lot of other factors that are um, causing the steep declines of these fish. So what is the plan in place to promote um, these fish numbers going into the future behind just hoping that ocean conditions and um, habitat improve? Yeah, thanks Kyle. Um, again, I'm hearing this idea of like hoping ocean conditions improve and Ocean conditions are a major driver of seal productivity. We know that, um, that's something we focused on. And um, for us, it's really easy to see that as, you know, something that changed four or five years ago. Um, and this is a great reason for us to, you know, um, sort of tighten up our bootstraps and put the fish on the spawning grounds like we need to. But I think you're also highlighting kind of a bigger societal problem about, you know, what are we trying to get out of these ecosystems? And so, um, there is things us as a larger fishing community can do that's beyond, you know, gear regulation changes. So I really encourage everybody to join that conversation. It's one we're a part of um, in the town halls for the preseason fisheries, you know, season setting process. That long term plan hasn't been a focus, but it, it's, you know, high on the agenda and it's something we're talking about. So 
um, invite you to that conversation and, and everybody on here to think creatively about um, what we can do beyond just hoping, right? Thanks. And next we have Reve. Reve, I have allowed you to unmute. Thank you, Leah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Thanks, James and Kelly. Um, I still haven't heard answers to my questions on some data incongruence that was presented in the past. Is that going to be released at some time? Um, and then I had the same question as the previous speaker, Brian, and I don't feel like you answered it. What is the estimated percentage of sport angler catch below the allocation for the hoe and quillute cool system? Yeah, so um, what I can say, and I think we've shared this math with you, Rebe, and maybe others too, in the Bentley et al. report, we've got an estimate of 1.1. Um, that's the you know, exploitation rate or encounter rate on a wild steelhead. Um, so what that suggests is we catch every fish 1.1 time. We have a 10% release mortality. Um, so then you can assume that this estimate taken from the Ho River, um, there's a lot of uncertainty when we apply it to other rivers. So we can walk through those spreadsheets. You know, we've been in meetings with you before, Reve, and I think they've been productive. Um, so if you want to do that again, we can walk through all these estimates. But I, I will highlight... Um, as we share these specific numbers, these are our estimates that we move into tribal co-management discussions with, we're sharing our estimates based on a Creole survey in the Ho River. Um, so again, lots of uncertainty. And that's compared with our uh, tribal co-managers where Kelly shared, you know, sort of this estimate of exploitation lower than their allocation. Those estimates are based on um, really high quality monitoring of their fisheries. And in most cases, um, that monitoring exceeds, you know, 50% of the fish are handled and shared weekly with us the number of fish caught. So real different math problems that we're under. Um, and so it, it does provide a, a whole bunch of uncertainty around our catch estimates. So when Brian or you asked specifically, what is the estimated catch from these fisheries? Um, we can provide numbers for each one of these rivers but we know um, there's a lot of error around those estimates at this time, so thanks. And next we have John. John, I have requested you to unmute. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a quick question about the Willapaw system. Uh, as I understood it, the Willapaw system was uh, below the escapement goal uh, as well as Chehalis, Hump Tulips, and Quinault and Queets, yet the Willapaw is going to have a season. Can you explain how that's possible? Yeah, John, great question. So um, in earlier town halls, we described the situation when the run size is coming in lower than the escapement goal. Um, we can allow uh, exploitation, a total exploitation of 10% or less. In places where we share that exploitation or with our treaty, our tribal co-managers, that 10%, uh, we try to estimate, you know, try to reduce impact to below 5%. So that's half of the 10. In Willapa, it's different because we don't have tribal co-managers that are exercising uh, steelhead or treaty rights towards steelhead fisheries. So that full 10% is allocated for the sport fishery. So that creates a uh, quite a bit different scenario than all of those other coastal rivers. So this regulation though, I think you're bringing up a really good point. The margin of error is extremely tight. So we have this conservative fishery this year in Willapa Bay um, where we've reduced the seasons in some rivers that were extending beyond March. Um, we've in some rivers reduced the bag limit to two and then um, we've allowed no fishing from a floating device. So these, all of these actions we think, and that 10% exploitation rate, um, we're confident that, that we'll fall below that. So I don't wanna um, sugarcoat that there is conservation concern in the Willapa Bay system, and we're gonna be watching that close. The one other thing I'd note here that's important that I haven't said yet is we'll be for the first time implementing a Creole in Willapa Bay. So this is not gonna be um, you know, a full robust Creole uh, sport fishing estimate, like catch estimate that we would want, but um, we're gonna run a pilot program in both Willapa and try to increase effort in the Coolie River 
and sort of improve those estimates in real time understanding of what those fisheries look like. So thanks for flagging that. And our next question is from Larry. Larry, I have allowed you to unmute. Thank you. Once again, James, I want to thank you and your staff for all your hard work. You've got a very difficult job here and you obviously <laughs> take it seriously and work hard on it. Um, I'm taking from this, we're not making any considerations about no floating devices for seniors, handicapped and youth. So we don't have any exceptions to the no fishing from a floating device rule like the ones you just described. Was that considered though? I'll let uh, Kelly take this one because it has been a focus of discussion, quite a bit of discussion, so. Yeah, thanks Larry, this is a tough one. Um, and I, I don't think there's any other way to say it, that the state's obligation is to provide ADA access where we, where we provide access, where we operate boat ramps, where we, where we have, uh, uh, you know, where we manage docks, where we, where we manage our, our own access. That's, that's where that obligation ends. And that's a harsh, that's a harsh response to a, a very difficult issue. So I understand, we understand that it's, it's impactful. It's impactful to, to, to folks with mobility issues and it's impactful to small children. Um, and, and although it's impactful, we feel that the regs we're putting in place are necessary in order for us to be able to prosecute a fishery that keeps us within those impacts. Okay. So being that folks can look at places like the, the Quileute and be able to participate in these fisheries, um, you know, and able to, 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 to fish from a floating device in certain places. And, and um, although maybe not uh, as satisfying an experience, but, but it is an experience, it is an opportunity. So okay. well, I, I, I just is. wanted to make sure that you guys had, and kick that around is obviously that you've had considered it in, in detail. So thank you for that. It's, um, one of, it's one of the things, Larry, that makes this really hard. Yeah. Um, considering uh, floating devices on Bogus Hill and Koala, below the 101 bridge, shouldn't it be below the hatchery? Because you're targeting hatchery there, right? Yep. Um, thanks, Larry. So those specific boundaries, there was a lot of discussion on where those boundaries should take place to provide adequate protection for these independent tributaries, all of them that we're watching extremely close. Um, so that 101 bridge was a source of, uh, you know, discussion with uh, the public, um, discussion we heard from the web portal and analysis of these regulations um, as we move them into different waters. So yeah, that's where we landed below the 101 bridge, but there was a lot of other alternatives there that we explored. So thanks. And our next question is from Christian. I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, thank you. How's it going? Everybody hearing? Yep. Hi James, uh, I know I spoke with you earlier this week through email. Um, I look forward to our talk later this week, probably. Um, uh, let's see, I'm liking the uh, call-ins are a little bit more friendly to the hatchery program tonight. Um, kind of talked about it and there definitely seems to just be this total anti-sentiment hatchery. Um, it seems like, I, I definitely appreciate you guys bringing out the diversified regs. Um, that was a big deal, not putting a blanket statement on the entire peninsula. Um, I really think you should just chop the Chehala system off. Um, a system with, what is it, three dams cannot be compared to rivers north of it. Uh, it needs to be stopped being compared to rivers north of it. Um, it's not similar to any of those systems out there. The Bogus Shield, the Queeds, the Ho, the Quinault. Um, let's see, it, it's starting to seem though that this this no fishing from a boat is is like it's, the no fishing from a boat is for the fly guys, and then the fishing from the boat is for only for hatchery. Like, why why aren't we using this opportunity to, to concentrate these these 
fisheries and actually get some hard data. You, you guys are complaining, we don't have data, we don't have data. Right now, you're talking about, oh, these are all going to be concentrated. There's going to be a lot of traffic. That's not a bad thing. That's not, that, that is not always a bad thing if you want to get some hard data. Um, sorry, my son's yelling. He's really in. He's into this, too. Uh, no problem. This is, why, this is why I'm passionate about it, because I, I want to get him out on the river. Um, I don't really care about getting anybody else on my boat on fish other than my two sons. Um, that is, that's what this is about for me. Um, so, uh, the whole, I'm glad it's getting away from, uh, blaming the tribes for this. This is not the tribe's fault. Um, I promise you, we start fixing our hatcheries and fixing the way we do this. Everybody's going to get along. Everybody's going to have enough fish, but I just don't want to get it to the point where there's this separation that you can only fish from a boat on a hatchery run. Why, why, why is that? We, we haven't proven that no fishing from a boat helps the fish in any way. I know for a fact it's increased counter encounters last year. It might have also increased with the catch per unit effort, but it also increased the encounters last year. You guys aren't talking about that. You're not saying, oh, actually this backfired, this rules made us encounter more fish. So I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I'm happy, but I'm also upset um, because it just seems like there's this line and being drawn in the sand and it's like special interest groups, fly fishing groups, and then gear guys, and then some fly guys. There's fly guys on our side, but it's really starting to seem that way. Um, these Wild Steelhead Coalition, Wild Salmon Center, Wild Fish Conservancy. I mean, we know who they are. We all know what y'all's intentions are. Um, we're not dumb. It, hey, Christian. Yeah. It, so. I appreciate the comments there. There's a lot to unpack there, but like you said, we've been you know, communicating back and forth here this week. It's been busy, but let's find time for you and I to sit down and chat about all these things. So thanks. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Leah, looking at the clock, we got time for one more. And then I want to, um, once we're done there, if we could go to the slide that has the, the web address, the portal address. So who's next, Leah? And last is Matt. Matt, I've allowed you to unmute. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for everyone for setting this up and just coordinating all the work that you guys have put into it. I understand it's probably just been stressful and a lot of work. Um, my, I mean, I spent what, seven years guiding in Alaska, I fished my whole life down here in Washington, Oregon, you name it. And we can all agree that these runs have been taking a hit since I was born 88, right? We're seeing a lot of stuff enacting these rules that they seem late and I'm more than happy to stop fishing for a few years. But like the last guy said, what about our kids, our future generations? So what are we doing ultimately and who is going to take the responsibility if these fisheries crash? Will that be you guys? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would just say if the, if the populations crash as the fish manager in region six, I take it really serious. So yeah, you know, I, I see these numbers that we've shared with you guys over the months and you know, they don't allow me to sleep well at night. So um, yeah, so that's heavy on our mind. Yeah, appreciate you flagging. Perfect. Of course, and man, I got, I, I hear these opportunities to speak with you. And I will say the last thing, we as a group of anglers, we need to stop fighting. We need to come together, which we're doing right now, stop taking the blame. And let's figure out some solutions. So there needs to be more resources associated to allowing anglers to come together for better resources and causes besides us coming together for a cause of losing this stuff. Once again, I appreciate you guys setting this up. Thanks again. Looking forward to opportunities down the road. Thanks, Matt. One last thing there. I wouldn't wait for us to create those opportunities. You're talking about anglers coming together. So we're going to try to create that environment here, but um, encourage you to keep Keep that that momentum going. Thanks. So if you could put it on the slide, it's got the web address. James, that'd be helpful. And while you're doing that, just want to reiterate what I said at the outset. Really greatly appreciate everybody's passion and and participation in this process. This this is going to conclude kind of our formal 
season setting process for this year, but this is something we're gonna, we're gonna continue to do into the future. One of the things I'm really uh, interested in is hearing your feedback on how we could improve this process moving forward. So in addition to any other comments you have for us uh, with respect to this year's regulations, please also think about um, uh, your kind of what you experienced uh, in these town hall meetings and throughout this season setting process. And if you feel, uh, if you feel like leading us some feedback for how to improve the process next year and the year after that, um, it would be it would be welcome. We we really appreciate it. So with that, I'll close out by saying uh, keep an eye out for that news release uh, um, tomorrow. Um, again, really appreciate everybody's engagement. Um, hope you had a a, a great holiday and. Uh, uh, just wish you all the best. Take care. Thank you.